In the workshop, collets to the left of me, collets to the right, and here I am stuck in the middle with a load of collets. In this box are a load of R8 collets, and in my opinion, for use in a milling machine, these are the best option. You only need one spanner to tighten the drawbar. Here's an example. This is a 5 8 of an inch diameter milling cutter, and it's a snug fit in the collet. This milling cutter is a slot drill. It has two cutting surfaces on it. Installation is simple. Just align the slot in the collet with the peg in the main spindle. Then all you have to do is draw the collet up into the spindle by using the drawbar with the nut at the top, like this. No juggling about with cutters in multi-size collets. It's just so much simpler. But the main benefit is obvious. The milling cutter is fitted directly into the main spindle so the whole assembly is much more rigid. OK, this is only a piece of brass I'm using for the test, but the milling cutter cuts it like butter. If you refer back to the previous video, you will hear that the sound is different. Initially, when I went over to RDG Tools, this is what I really went to buy, but then it occurred to me that if I bought the ER40 system, I could use it both on the milling machine and the small boxwood lathe, but in reality, I prefer it this way. As you've just seen, the cutter fits into the collet, the collet fits into the spindle. What could be simpler? Maybe apart from a girlfriend I used to know many years ago. I'll rephrase that, it doesn't sound right. I don't mean a body part from a girlfriend I used to know many years ago. I mean, apart from a girlfriend I used to know many years ago. This horrible old milling machine that I have is a manual milling machine. So why don't I get a better one with automatic feeds and maybe even a digital readout? Well, as I've mentioned to many expert viewers who seem to write in and tell me off for using crappy machinery, the reason that I started making these videos, and the reason why I continue to make them, is to help beginners who are just starting off in the hobby. So yes, it would be very nice to have a Bridgeport milling machine or similar in my workshop, if only I had the space. But then, it's going to be one-upmanship on the beginners. And that's why I use this really old Taiwanese milling machine. It does what it says on the tin, it's not fancy, it's not very well finished, and it's pretty horrible really, although I've made some very good things on it over the last 35 years. As a general rule though, if you're setting up a home workshop, try and buy the very best machinery you can afford, then you will only buy it once. This is an end mill, the other one was a slot drill for cutting slots really, but this is an end mill with four cutting surfaces, and this is a three quarters of an inch diameter end mill, it's quite a big one. And in this test, I'm going to see how well it cuts using the side of it. Just in case anything goes wrong, I'm using a piece of brass bar because I don't want to damage the cutter if it shakes loose. So first of all, I'm taking a gentle cut about a third of the way down the bar. And at this depth, the machine is hardly even trying. I increase the depth of the cut and apart from a very slight tonal change in the sound, it's still cutting very well. Normally, I would only ever cut in one direction using a milling cutter where possible, and that is with the cutting part of the milling cutter cutting against the work. But for this demonstration, I'm cutting in both directions, and it seems to be fine all the way around. Milling becomes an entirely different operation when you're using larger cutters, and this at three quarters of an inch is classified in my workshop as fairly large. The only reason I'm not taking a much heavier cut is this is a piece of brass bar, and this stuff is expensive, but with a three quarters of an inch diameter end mill fitted into an R8 collet, it is capable of taking a lot more metal off in one pass. So what's the finish like? Well, I think that's pretty good really for such a large milling cutter, using such a light duty milling machine. The main thing I like about this system, well apart from the fact that it's much more rigid, is the speed at which you can change the collets and the cutters. So I definitely give the use of R8 collets directly in the spindle, a big thumbs up. The spindle of my old Boxford lathe is not R8 though, so I can't use the R8 collets in this. I need to use a Morse taper number 3 collet chuck. I bought a length of M12 studding. This is ordinary studding. I asked for high tensile, but they didn't have it in M12. But this should be fine. It's only to pull the Morse taper number 3 into the spindle, and then the Morse taper will do the rest, and it's not going to go anywhere. This is a very long length of M12 rod, so I marked it off when I'm going to cut it. What I need on this system is a spacer. And here I am on my old Smart and Brown lathe making the spacer. 
A friend of mine a while back gave me some cast iron and said, try this for making pistons, it's really good. And indeed it is. As this spacer is going to be a permanent part of my lathe kit, I thought I would make it from some of this special cast iron. This is not the soft, fluffy, close grain cast iron that I'm used to. This is much harder. It's superb stuff. I have to reduce the diameter of this piece of bar in two areas. The smaller diameter fits down the end of the spindle. It's not a very tight fit, but it does fit down the end of the spindle. And the diameter of the rest of the piece of bar just has to clear the guard that covers the change wheels. I'm really having to be careful parting this stuff off. It's quite hard and very tenacious. But eventually I get there and the part drops off into the chip tray. I'm using plenty of oil for this. I've never noticed this, but you can really see the parting tool bending as it goes into the work. But to be fair, I don't normally put my eyes quite so close to the chuck, but the camera can see. Time now to drill a hole down the middle, starting with a large centre drill, followed by a twist drill that is approximately the size of M12. This is not a precision component at all, it's just a spacer. It's not a part for a rocket, a steam turbine, a gas turbine or a satellite. I've speeded the video up for the drilling operation because it did take quite a long time. Eventually though, the drill goes all the way through and then it's time to turn the part around in the chuck to machine the other end because the finish left by the parting tool was less than perfect. You will also notice I've chamfered the corners to remove the sharp edge. Initially when I tried it as a spacer, it was a little bit too big and it was catching the guard, so I turned it down and here's the finishing cut, the final cut, before I fit it to the machine. As I reduced the diameter of the spacer considerably, the original chamfer was turned away. So here I'm re-chamfering the end. Everything fitted perfectly, the drawbars in place and tightened up. So the collet chuck is pulled firmly into the spindle. Time now to fit the collet nose, complete with the collet. Fitting these ER40 collets had me fooled at first. I tapped them in with a soft mallet, but if you put them in at an angle, they just snap in. Very simple, and they also snap out. My brain didn't allow for this logic. It was Richard at RDG Tools who told me how to do it. I'm never too old to learn. I need to buy a large spanner to fit the flats on this collet chuck. So I'm measuring between the flats with my vernier caliper. What's that? Metric 45.88? My largest barco spanner doesn't come anywhere near. I need to buy a much bigger one. In this clip, I'm applying some ultraviolence to the other end of the drawbar so I can remove the chuck. The Morse tape and number 3 tapers on the chuck and the spindle took some breaking. I'm a bit concerned about the threads on the spindle being exposed, so I think I'm going to make a sleeve that fits over this when the ER40 collet chuck is fitted. I've decided to make up a drip feed coolant service for both of my lathes with a small plastic tank which can be placed in close proximity to the piece of metal being turned. So I bought a couple of packs of these fittings so I could make a long pipe. If you look at the text on the back of the pack, at the top it says adjustable length and interchangeable components with easy hand assembly. But it's not easily assembled by my hands, and my hands are fairly big and strong. Eventually I gave it up as a bad job and had a quick Google around the intershed, and it soon became apparent that you need a special tool to do this. And when this special tool arrives in the post, I intend to make a video showing how to make a portable coolant service using these components and a small plastic tank. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.